Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Museum After Hours. I'm Trey Johnson, Assistant Director of Education and Outreach here at the Kansas Historical Society. Tonight, we are joined by Jeremiah Aries, Professor of Art at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. Aries received his Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Kansas City Art Institute and his Master of Fine Arts from the State University of New York at Buffalo. Through projects like Reconsidering Landscape, Staging the West, and Louisiana Trail Riders, Aries has attempted to deconstruct the mythology of the American West. His work examines the constructs of American identity within personal, community, and political contexts. Tonight, Aries will highlight small town newspaper offices seeking to visualize democracy in the United States. These photographs celebrate the civic function, labor, and technology at the heart of local newspapers production, and Aries seeks to honor these local newspapers and the individuals who steward them. After the program, we'll have some time to answer a few questions, so be sure to use that Q&A feature or the chat, pose questions as they come to you, and we'll get to as many as we can. So let's all welcome Jeremiah Aries. Hello, and thank you for joining me. So one other little detail I want to add about my biography that feels very important is that I'm from Great Bend, Kansas, and Great Bend is a small town in the center of the state. And so for the past 20 years, my work has been about how American identity is represented in our culture. And though I wouldn't say my work has been political, I have been concerned with political forces. So during and since the Trump presidency, there has been a shift in my work. And I set out trying to understand what was happening in my country, what I was hearing, what I was reading, the pictures I was seeing from around the nation. I felt I needed to bear witness to be in these places, to try to understand the direction of the country. And I didn't know what I was looking for. I didn't know where things would lead. I certainly didn't know what I was going to photograph. But during the pandemic lockdown and in the run-up to the 2020 presidential election, I began traveling through the swing states of the country, the battleground states. And I started a project called the Talking Hard Traveling Battleground Blues, in which I sought to take the temperature of our nation and search for visible signs of democracy. And I photographed a range of subjects, um, all kinds of things caught my attention, but I was thinking about what I was hearing in the news, what I was reading about. And I was thinking about the sites of police violence. I was walking through city streets concealed under plywood, shuttered from summer protests. Landscapes transformed by an unprecedented number of natural disasters, thinking about the windstorms in the Midwest, hurricanes in the South where I live, an unprecedented number of hurricanes came through in 2020, and wildfires in the West. I was thinking about the militarized Texas-Mexico border, the wall, but I also sought to visualize the democratic process. And so I ended up going to these election campaign offices, as well as local newspaper offices. And I received a tip that a newspaper in Missouri, the North Missouri and in Gallatin, Missouri, that has been published since 1864, I heard that the paper was about to close. And it was somebody who was from that town that contacted me. So I reached out to the editor and asked if I could visit the day they published their final issue. And so I arrived in the morning as the husband and wife team, Daryl and Liz, publishers of the paper, were editing the stories. And once these stories were approved, Lee, the printer, prepared the presses. And Lee told me he'd begun working there when he was 15 years old. And that after 65 years in the industry, that this would be his last day. 
I, along with family members and a couple people from the community, had gathered to watch the final newspaper come off the press. And so as it was coming off, I was reading the headlines and I was surprised because I didn't see anything about this being the final issue. And it was only a, when I turned the newspaper over, I saw a very small column, the left-hand side of the paper, below the fold, a notice of a termination. Notice of termination. And so before I left, I was packing up my camera equipment and I went back into the office and I told Daryl, I was thanking him for letting me be there for the day. And I told him I couldn't help but notice that it seems that he had buried his lead on the final issue. And he let that sink in for a moment and he sat down, I think a little uncertain about what he meant, but then it, then it hit him. And he just smiled slightly and he leaned back in his chair and he told me, we're not the story. And I think this is the moment that I was convinced that these publications are the story and that I would focus a body of work on small town newspapers. And so initially I expanded my coverage. So if I was just working in the battleground states, I expanded nationally before ultimately deciding to focus the work on Kansas, my home state. James Joyce once said that in the particular is contained the universal. If I could photograph the newspapers in the geographic center of the country, in the heart of America, I felt they could be a window to consider journalism and rural newspapers nationwide. And so with the time afforded me from a sabbatical from my university at LSU, I traveled home to Kansas. And beginning in the no Northwest corner of the map, I started driving East, stopping at every newspaper office along the way, every little town. And so I do want to just make a note that even though I'm, I'm going to tell a story, I'm going to tell you about these images, I'm going to share my motivations, my work and what I really have to say is contained in the images. And so I hope that you're able to really look at the photographs. If possible, read the titles. They'll give more information. Sometimes I have quotes on there, but Really, everything I have to say, I hope, is contained in those photographs. So these photographs, they celebrate the civic function, labor, and technology at the heart of local newspapers production. And initially, I was only photographing in the interior offices, but eventually it became important for me to show the newspapers as part of their communities, often located on the main street of town. I wanted to show the architecture of rural America and the names of the newspapers, the Prairie Post, the Rural Messenger, the Johnson Pioneer. And I just, I loved these newspaper names and so, I, I just really wanted to feature them. There's the grass and grain in Manhattan, the tiller and toiler in Larned, Kansas. And I thought together these photographs create a collective portrait of Kansas. And so in August, I began an artist residency in Mattfield Green. This allowed me a place to be for uh, a period of time and that I could work from that southeastern part of the state. And my very first day in residence, the, uh, there was a speaker series going on. And the speaker uh, that was starting literally like 10 minutes after I pulled into town was Kevin Wilmot, who is a filmmaker and screenwriter and who, uh, with Spike Lee, wrote Black Klansman, uh, winning an Oscar for both gentlemen. And Kevin was there to screen his most recent documentary, William Allen White, What's the Matter with Kansas? And White was the influential newspaper editor of the Emporia Gazette. 
And he was another reason that I wanted to focus my work on Kansas. So it was just a perfect sort of collision here, uh, being able to talk with uh, uh, Kevin. And the Emporia Gazette would become a centerpiece of my project, though for reasons I hadn't anticipated. And so a week later, I arrived at the stately two-story office with the name of the paper chiseled in stone across the front. I approached the grand wooden entrance and reached for the bronze handles, the shape of lion's heads, and pulled to open the door to discover it locked. Peering into the windows, I could see relics from the former newspaper office, now absent of journalists. Built in 1900, it was home to the Gazette for 122 years. The following week, I was able to gain access to the building from Chris Walker, an heir to William Allen White and the owner of the Gazette, which is still operating from a small office around the corner. The paper, like many I'd visit, had downsized. The New York Times reports that more than 300 newspapers have closed their doors since the pandemic began. Since 2005, that number is 2,500. And many of those that remain are mere shadows of their former selves. Inside the historic office, a portrait of William Allen White hung on the wall near the entrance. Many of his personal effects had been left. In the wood paneled room that has been his office, the head of a sculpted stag lay on the floor. Chris granted me two great privileges for a photographer, access and freedom. I hope Chris is watching, if so, thank you. I was free to wander the building and uh, make photographs. I photographed the former dark room. On the second floor, I found a closet stacked with green linen bound archives of the newspaper. The brittle yellow paper crumbling gathered at the floor. A black and white photograph of the newsroom from 1938 hung on an otherwise empty wall. And in the main newsroom hung a large world map, which reminded me that these newspapers were a community's connection to the world. Not long after, someone would share this photograph with me. And the photographer who made the image, his name is Michael K. Dakota, uh, was a former employee at the Gazette, later wrote to me providing these details. The gentleman on the back right side of the image is Ray Cow. He started as a photographer for the son of William Allen White, William Lindsay White. He eventually became an editor and managed the newsroom. He would carry a key and every morning wind the clock that sits against the map. It was just a few years after this photo was taken that layoffs and downsizing started. We still had copy editors and reporters had beats. I think we all knew the end was coming, but none of us imagined how quickly everything would change. I was further exploring the former Gazette office and I went through this long wall of wooden shelves looking for other subjects to photograph. And starting from one end, I was opening up every cabinet, finding it empty. And the very last one, there was a lone book left behind, the book, First Amendment Freedoms. Eerily, a calendar for July, 2022, just one month prior to my visit remained taped to the chalkboard. And I felt that the body was still warm and this building had one more story to tell. My experience of arriving to a newspaper office to find it in an empty building was repeated again and again. The Newton Kansan at the Dodge City Daily Globe at the El Dorado Times, the Wellington Daily News, 
and many others. And at nearly every office, the signs still hung from the vacant buildings. And in some cases, the newspapers had downsized and moved to smaller locations, while others had ceased publication altogether. And this gave my photographs a sense of urgency. And I decided that I had to photograph all the newspaper offices in Kansas. And so this sent me just running around the state, just driving uh, in a grid from edge to edge. So the American author Richard Kluger has once said that every time a newspaper dies, even a bad one, the country moves a little closer to authoritarianism. Time and again, I found poetic still lives in the newspaper offices. In the front window of the former Beloit call rested a coiled corded telephone in an otherwise empty building. An open dictionary in the Clay Center dispatch, the first word on the page, disinheritance. The last word, disparagement. Couldn't make this up. Couldn't possibly find that page in a hundred years. Soldiers in silhouette saluting a flag at what appears to be a funeral service for a Memorial Day edition of the paper. The printing plate still wet with ink, still in the press. And so I was often focusing on the details in an environment. Uh, as a photographer, these were just rich, rich environments. And I was looking for a way to bring a viewer into these spaces. I want to create an image that allows the eye to touch these patinaed surfaces. And in this photograph, though you probably can't read it on the screen, uh, uh, you can read former employee names written in pencil. Harry, 1951. Joe Hall, last day, June 19th, 1961. Keith, 2007, among other names. Kevin Wilmot told me this, a storyteller's job is to make the invisible visible. I was particularly interested in the dark rooms for obvious reasons. And if you don't know what a dark room is, that's where photographs will, used to be printed before digital photography. Photographs were made on film. That film would have to be processed and each individual picture printed in a dark room. This is an enlarger. Below the enlarger are reams of 35 millimeter film. And this is where the pictures would be made. There's also a superb history of photojournalism from Kansas. And just some names, I'm thinking of W. Eugene Smith, Jim Richards, Pete Souza, to name just a few. So Smith, who was from Wichita, Kansas, at the age of 15, had pictures published in the Wichita Press before graduating high school and moving away to New York. But Smith is considered instrumental in developing the editorial photo essay, that a story could be told in a series of pictures. I mean, this is what I'm doing. This is where he started. Richardson worked at the Topeka Capital Journal from 1970 to 1981, after which time he began working for the National Geographic and photographed all around the world. And I especially appreciate the photos from Cuba, Kansas, uh, two examples here, uh, a town that he photographed for over 40 years. Souza started his career at the Chanute Tribune and the Hutchinson News, and eventually he would become the chief official White House photographer for both the Reagan and Obama administrations. So the closures of the newspapers only highlighted how perilous our democracy was and continues to be at this historic moment. And I was making these photographs just prior to the 2022 midterms. And many of us felt that democracy itself was on the ballot. I also feared that if I could not get to every office that fall, I didn't know which ones would be open if I were to return. 
And generally my photographs unfold over many years. I work on projects for years at a time, sometimes a decade or more. I want time itself to be a subject in my work. But with this project, it was different. I felt I needed to make a document of this historic moment right now, what was happening right now. In 2019, a Pan American study concluded, as local journalism declines, government officials conduct themselves with less integrity, efficiency, and effectiveness, and corporate malfeasance goes unchecked. With the loss of local news, citizens are less likely to vote, less politically informed, and less likely to run for office. A quarter of the nation's newspapers have closed in the last 15 years. So to see these spaces vacated, to find these voices silenced, the press is still, is a way to visualize what is being lost. David Webb, publisher of the Protection Press writes, newspapers are a community's living, breathing personality. Weekly or daily accounts of activities and events prove that a town or city is alive. And informed residents and businesses in such places help reinforce that sense of community. Papers provide a location with a focus and identity. But while there's been a decline of local news, there's been a spread of disinformation on the internet. Trump cries fake news and declares journalists enemies of the people. And this decline of local news works in devastatingly perfect concert with the right-wing disinformation machine. And amongst all this noise, our local newspapers are quietly closing. The forces leading to the closing of newspapers are many. In the early 2000s, the introduction of Craigslist list led to a crash in classified advertising. Shortly thereafter, Facebook and Google both began building their companies off free content of newspapers while absorbing their advertising revenue. Online shopping took money away from local businesses that might buy ad space. Then with the 2008 financial crisis and the great recession that followed, newspapers saw what little advertising revenue remained tumble along with circulation numbers. Layoffs and buyouts cut staff at newspapers of every size. And I heard people tell me over and over again that when they started working for the newspaper, there was a staff of 30 or 40 people, and now there were three or four. And at many newspapers I visited, there was one, one person to handle all the operations. Declining rural populations is another issue facing small town newspapers. In January, I visited the Signal Enterprise in Alma, Kansas, and they had just printed a special end of the year edition for 2021 and they listed the 2021 reported births and obituaries for Wabunzi County. And there were seven births and 142 obituaries. Each time I print an obituary, one editor tells me, I lose a reader. For many, it was the corporate takeover of the local newspapers that spelled the end. The corporations Gannett and Gatehouse Media, the largest and second largest newspaper chains, bought newspapers across the country. They eventually merged, giving the combined newspaper giant control of one of every six newspapers in America. Chad Fry of the Newton Kansan writes, when I started the Newton Kansan in about 1999, there were about 35 employees. Circulation was at about 8,000 for a six day a week publication, but times have changed dramatically. A corporate cut your way to prosperity mindset started cutting employees. 
And Chad continues, the newsroom, as it always does, felt it first. People leaving would not be replaced. People were shown the door. The cuts always came to the newsroom first. And in 1999, that newsroom had seven and a half employees within it. Today, there are two. We're expected to try and turn out the same amount of content as those seven and a half did. And at times we do. There may not be reporters around, but there is plenty of news to gather, but we have our limits. The cuts came to the advertising department and then the press room was completely eliminated in one swoop. Cuts to the business office came next and the position of publisher was absorbed into the company. The cuts were no longer around the edges and they kept coming and coming. But somehow our 35 year veteran sports reporter and I survived. So then came the ownership of private equity firms and these absentee owners drove the newspapers into the ground, stripping them of profits before exiting the company. Short-term profits were made and the newspapers, often the oldest businesses in town, were hollowed out or closed for good. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry. At the McPherson Sentinel, I met a young woman, uh, Brenna. And when I came into the office on the main street of McPherson, she was working alone in an office that had eight empty cubicles. <laughs> and she started working for the newspaper just about a month before my visit and has been trying to revitalize that paper. So the main street office had been closed for three years. The Sentinel, founded in 1887, was purchased by Gannett from local owners in 2016. A few years later, it was sold to Gatehouse Media. And the office had been mostly empty. A computer was left plugged in at one terminal, which is what we see in the photograph. And this computer had a password <laughs> that Brenna was unable to crack, uh, making the machine useless. That password was written on a dry erase board and it was hanging up on the wall. And the clue was, what is Linda on the weekend? So we're all still trying to figure that out. I asked Brenna last week if she had figured it out and it's still a question mark. Maybe we can help her. Cherry Rhodes purchased the paper the year before and Brenna was trying to make it feel like a hometown paper again. And so rather than work from home, which she was encouraged to do, she insisted on being in the office where the town knew how to find her. A receptionist comes in two days a week. A sports writer works from home. Her editor, who edits multiple papers, is in North Dakota. And Brenna recently graduated college. She believes in local journalism and is trying to rebuild subscribers in this town of just under 14,000 people. In larger towns such as Hutchinson and Topeka, the newspapers are owned by Gannett. And try as I might, I could not reach someone in the local office. My emails went unanswered. There was no one to take phone calls. A couple of times I found an out-of-state number listed, but when I called it, if I was able to reach somebody, it sounded like they'd never even been to the town and were no help. And so when I just simply showed up at the offices, I found the doors locked. There were signs indicating that they were closed to the public. At Salina, another town of similar size, about 40,000 people, there's no longer a newspaper at all. So this is in part what made the newspapers I did photograph stand out. Small towns such as Protection, Kansas, population 503. Coldwater, Kansas, population 672, still publish local newspapers. The Protection Press and the Western Star, respectively. And dotted across the prairie, nearly every 20 to 30 miles is a newspaper that has persevered. On a road map, I just started marking every town where I photographed a newspaper office in this gold paint pen. And these stars just accumulated over the fall and uh, started to look like a constellation across the night sky, this gold paint pen. 
And when I returned to Louisiana at the end of November, I counted these little golden dots and found that I'd photographed 125 offices in all. And so this is the light. This is the good news. The newspapers that endure. Kansas is the spotlight of America. Her pioneer editors kindled a beacon which flames across the sky to this hour. I found these words, I found this quote in a book titled The History of Kansas Newspapers, published in 1916. David Powells, the editor of the Holton Recorder, told me that he'd found this in his desk when he bought the newspaper. He'd been looking at old uh, photographs of the office and thought that this desk had likely be belonged to the very first publisher who owned the paper, which was started in 1869, and that this book likely belonged to him as well. He generously lent me this very fragile copy, imploring me to read it. David tells me independent community newspapers have never been more important. The book ties the identity of the state and its quest to freedom to the newspapers. And as a person from Kansas, this is another point of pride for me. This was another thing that I just so appreciated about this work, why it felt so important to me. Quote from this book from 1916, quote, and no other state was the press as a whole ever equal to that of Kansas in either ability or enterprise. This high standard was set up in the stirring territorial period when Kansas was battling for freedom for herself and liberty for America. The book provides a first person account of Kansas newspapers dating back to 1854, the territorial days when battles were waged to determine if Kansas would be a free or a slave state. The decision would tip the union in either direction, ultimately leading to civil war. The history of the Kansas press, the book argues, is tied to the fact that the state was founded on the ideal that all men should be free. Before statehood, some of the country's brightest minds, editors, preachers, abolitionists came to Kansas territory to fight for this freedom. Some came with guns and ammo, but their most powerful weapon was the press. They founded in newspapers not yet settled, becoming the first businesses, even before there was a town or a readership. Quote from the book, the first Kansas banner was a newspaper. It made its advent under an elm tree on the town site of Leavenworth, September 15, 1854. There was not yet a house to be seen, nor any other definite signs of civilization. The printing press preceded all the usual agencies of society. It did not wait for the rudimentary clutter of things to be composed and organized. The spirit of adventure thrust it forward ahead of the calaboose, the jail, the post office, the school, the church, and made it a symbol of conquest. By the time Kansas admission into the Union on January 29, 1861, there were 22 newspapers operating in the territory. By the conclusion of the Civil War in 1865, there were 37 newspapers operating in Kansas, the same number that existed in the whole country when the Declaration of Independence was proclaimed. John James Ingalls, who was said to have coined the state motto, ad astra per aspera, to the stars through difficulties, became one of the first state senators in 1862. He was also the editor of the Atchison newspaper, Freedom's Champion. And by the time of his death in 1900, there were over 500 newspapers in the state. And in this book, I also learned that the newspaper men founded the Kansas State Historical Society. Perfect for the talk. William Connolly in 1916 writes, they knew Kansas, knew her ideals and traditions and how to serve them and preserve them. 
A copy of every issue of every paper published in Kansas is furnished in the Historical Society for its files. These files are carefully preserved and bound. The collection reaches back to the founding of the society in 1875, and it is now, again, this is 1916, but it is now believed to be the largest newspaper collection in the world, comprising more than 50,000 bound volumes. Kansas is the pioneer in this idea of preserving the state's newspapers. So 2022, when I was making the majority of these photographs, turned out to be a milestone year because many of the newspapers that I would photograph had recently or were about to reach their 150th year anniversary. And so I walked into the Newton Kansan on the day of their sesquicentennial, and the staff member had prepared three cakes, a uh, triple chocolate, a carrot, and a strawberry with the number 150, 150 stuck into the pink frosting. And so I found many individuals that continue this rich legacy of Kansas journalism and give me hope the local newspapers will continue to be institutions in their communities. Susan Lynn and her son Tim are an example. And Susan is the editor and publisher of the Iola Register. Her family has owned and operated the newspaper since its origin in 1867. On the back wall of the office hangs a portrait of her, her father, her grandfather, and her great-grandfather, each portrait made at the time of their ownership. Her son, Tim, had recently moved back to Iola from New York City, where he was a teacher. He is now the managing editor, and presumably his portrait will one day hang beside his mother's. And Tim told me that his mom probably had the greatest challenges in her time as editor, working during the era of unprecedented change to the industry, and as a woman where only men had stood before. The Iola continues to be a leader in the community, and it will take a stand. And so in the recent election to determine abortion rights in Kansas, they published editorials supporting women's choice, but it had consequences. They lost advertisers, including the largest advertiser in the community, which was a Catholic church. But I think that that's what it takes to be a leader. And you take a hit from time to time. And it was exactly that spirit which spoke to me of the importance of local newspapers. An editor like William Allen White often wrote on popular columns that challenged his community. And people might not know how they felt about an issue and maybe they didn't have time to really consider it. Just think about how busy we are today. It's hard to really just put our minds to a particular issue. Or maybe they didn't agree with him at all. But he was someone that townspeople knew, someone they might see walking out of a grocery store. Maybe their kids went to school together. He was someone in the community and they were less likely to dismiss him out of hand. And so this is why in polls, even as people's trust in news has declined, local news is seen as more trustworthy. But this is what we're losing. Editors who are leaders in their community, newspapers that reflect the needs and concerns of a town, and the offices that hold a community's collective history in archives. And I feel that what we are losing is far greater than ink and paper. It's the fabric which ties a community together and underlies our American democratic experiment. Tim Stafford, the managing editor of the Iola Register writes, the decimation of America's newspapers over the last two decades has been well-documented. The story has been told and it's a tragedy. But here we are, still standing, still publishing five days a week, still telling our community story. A newspaper in 2022 informs its readers, sure. But its real purpose is to tie each reader to another, to give its community a spirit, a shared reality, and a sense of purpose and possibility. So this work, these photographs are 
very special to me. So as a young person, I couldn't get out of the state fast enough. <laughs> uh, left the day I graduated high school. And now looking back, I can see how much I've been shaped by, especially my aesthetic sensibility has been shaped by my native surroundings, this austere landscape of the plains. And I feel that these newspapers are such a rich subject. Uh, it's a once feels somewhat autobiographical to me because it describes myself as an artist while communicating concerns I have as a citizen. And I'm thinking about rural America. I'm thinking about the political forces. I'm witnessing the effects of unbridled capitalism that puts profits before people. In my hometown, I photographed uh, the Tribune where someone I'd gone to high school with was working behind the desk. And in the surrounding communities, I was taking pictures, sometimes literally of the same building, of the places that I first photographed when I first got a camera and uh, was learning photography in college. So the work is like so personal to me. And this collision of form in the photographs and content that it happened here in this place that I was so desperate to run away from underlies why it is so important to me. I found so much beauty here. I want to find an opportunity to come back to Kansas. And so I'm putting together a newspaper style publication that will feature a selection of these photographs along with dispatches from Kansas written by people working in the industry. I read some excerpts from some of those uh, this evening and I plan to print it in Kansas. And I hope that you will seek it out when it's published later this year. So for more information about this, you can check my website and you can also see more images from Kansas newspapers. And uh, you can see other projects that I've done as well. And so I also really hope to work with a Kansas institution to be able to bring a large scale exhibition of the photographs home to the state of Kansas. And so I'm grateful for the people that shared their stories about the newspaper industry with me. And if you have a story about working in the industry or about how you or your community has been affected by a newspaper, or the lack of one, please reach out. My email is on my website. Uh, before I close, I just want to acknowledge a few people whose support has been instrumental to this work. And um, without their assistance, I would not have been able to bring the time and attention to this project, which I must emphasize is not complete. I'm going to return in May to photograph. There's a little section of the map that I didn't get to. And also, I want to visit more of the offices that I'd photographed the exteriors of, but was unable to get inside. So I want to thank the Tallgrass Artist Residency. I want to thank uh, Mattfield Green Works, the Volin Foundation, Margaret Sullivan, whose book Ghosting the News, Local Journalism and the Crisis of American Democracy, so clearly and urgently outlined the threats to the newspaper industry and what's at stake. Kathy Holt, if you're out there, Kathy, hello, who provided me quarters in a historic 19th century hotel. And the room I was staying in had once been uh, a newspaper, uh, the New West Echo in Cimarron, Kansas. I want to thank uh, Derek Ham, who was working with me on the publication. Uh, Dr. Kenneth Bell, who was a former publisher and editor of the Haskell County Monitor Chief in Sublette, Kansas who was the first person to invite me into a newspaper office and reveal this world of possibility. Sadly, Ken died last year and the office seems to be closed. But to all of you, and I hope there's some editors out there who graciously invited me into your offices and permitted me to photograph freely, thank you so much. I wanna thank mom, of course, <laughs> my maternal family homesteaded in Kansas, and were among the early pioneers of the state. This history is my history. So I wanna thank you for listening and I want to take any questions that you might have. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much for that, Jeremiah. It was 
Incredible. And definitely everybody be sure to, uh, I dropped the uh, website in the chat. So definitely go check out some more of Jeremiah's work and uh, you can really get a, a full screen, uh, high quality uh, <laughs> viewing of all of all of his images. Um, so yeah, let's let's get to some questions. Um, we have a thank you uh, from one of our attendees. Thank you for documenting the history of Kansas newspapers and their importance. I can tell you are a true believer in what you do. This may be a hard question to answer, but do you agree with the angle on your project that made it seem like we are dead or well on our way? While we face our challenges like many other industries, there are many amazing stories of second career journalists, new startups, et cetera. Thank you for your time and efforts on our behalf. Thank you for the question. I, I appreciate that very much. And yeah, it's it's really tough because um, I've heard so many wonderful stories. I wanted to share some of those stories with you today. Um, I could I could have another hour and share even <laughs> more of those stories with you. And so there is this perseverance. And I found a lot of hope in these newspaper offices. And that's one of the things that I really wanted to underline in tonight's talk is just the number of newspapers that continue in operation across the state. And I'll tell you, that is not normal. I live in Louisiana. I have visited more newspaper offices in a single day in Kansas than I think there is an entire state of Louisiana. So Kansas <laughs> is special. Um, it is special, but as I said at the beginning of this talk, I wanted Kansas to be representative of a national industry. I wanted, I wanted people to be thinking about newspapers across the country. And across the country, those statistics that I read, that's real. A quarter of the newspaper offices have closed in the last 15 years. And um, the you know, the fears that I have are, are are legitimate. And I think that that is why that part of the project has really triggered a lot of people. Uh, the people that I've heard the most from, uh, people that have written me when uh, stories come out are people that have worked in the newspaper industry and so recognize not just the kind of places that I'm showing, but recognize what has happened as a whole. And, you know, I heard over and over again, it was like a gut punch to, to look at these photographs. And so um, that can't be ignored either. And so I want these things to be in tandem. Uh, um, that hope is why I'm telling that story. So I don't know if that gets at your question. I, I hope it does. Um, maybe when I'm back, we can <laughs> have a longer talk. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, another question. All right. Um, uh, another thanks, uh, this time from Lois. Uh, at this point, do you see a way for local newspapers to make a resurgence? It's a big one. That's, that's really hard. And I, you know, I'm, I'm I'm here speaking to you, so it feels like I'm an expert in some way, and I'm not an expert in this. My, I'm an I'm an artist. I'm a photographer. I have experience. I've visited a lot of newspaper offices. I mean, just in Kansas, um, the ones that I've shown you today, but also I was visiting newspapers across the country before I decided to focus this on Kansas. So I visited a lot and. I agree that I think they're more important than ever. I think people are finding a way. And, you know, I've met with some journalists recently that um, uh, talked to some journalists, been interviewed by some journalists who have worked in the mainstream industry who are trying to carve out new paths. And that's exciting. And I, I don't really, I don't really know. I don't know. I wish I did. Well, we don't expect you to have all the answers. <laughs> uh, Sally asks if you managed to uh, uh, get to Montgomery County, Kansas, Independence, Kansas, 
in Coffeyville, Kansas with three newspapers. That is the little section I didn't get to. That's where I'm going to come in May. I was trying. I was really trying. I was so close. And I have one little section that goes up uh, as far as like Fort Scott, Kansas, and, and that very eastern part of the state. I'm going to make that swing when I get back. All right. Well, you'll have to keep us posted and uh, and let Sally know. <laughs> um, again, you've got a ton of things rolling in. Um, Chad uh, says, uh, thank you, Jeremiah. Oh. This is important work you are doing. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, maybe that's the Chad whose words I read. So I hope I did you justice, sir. Thank you. <laughs> um, I got a question uh, asking if the presentation will be able to be viewed again. Uh, absolutely. So we live stream to YouTube. And if you just go to our YouTube channel at Kansas Historical Society, uh, there is a playlist uh, from all of our Museum After Hours talks. So uh, you have enough content to probably last you a, a couple of months. So you can, uh, I can definitely drop that link uh, when we get to the next question and you can just forward that on to your dad. Um, and I would just say also one, one of the things that I'm, I'm really proud about of you know, being from Kansas, that this work is from, from Kansas, that as an artist, I, I try to use the local, I try to focus on a really specific issue and hope that that opens a conversation up to larger national concerns. And I've been really heartened that this work has had a, a national audience, that um, there's been some national publications to feature it. And um, I think there's gonna be some more to come. And I've been asked to speak about this work. I'm glad that the first time I'm speaking about it, it's in Kansas. And I, I, I'm hoping it's to the, the people who so generously let me into their offices and whose places I'd photograph. But over the next year, um, I'm speaking about this in different places across the country next week in Denver, Colorado, in person. <laughs> um, and, and so, I'm gonna be representing Kansas out there across the country. And it makes me proud to do it. And, um, you know, people are looking for a source of hope. And I think that seeing this work and seeing the number of places open in the state is gonna be a source of hope. Very well said. Um, Carol says, uh, they're so glad that Jeremiah focused on this work and shared it with us. The subject is dear to me. I have ties to several Kansas newspapers for various reasons. Uh, well, thank you, Carol. Uh, so this one, uh, could you repeat the name of that book, uh, the, the really fragile one? Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'm just, I'm going to go back <laughs> to where I show the copy and I don't know if David Powell's is out there in the audience, but man, what what a what a guy! Like <laughs> this book published in 1916. And I'll say at first when I came into his office, he was a little suspicious of me. <laughs> he was more than a little suspicious of me. Um, <laughs> he he came and sat me down, and you know showed I showed my identification, answered a bunch of questions. But by the end of that visit, here he was giving me this book over a century old. I mean, what an artifact, what a piece of history. And he just lent that to me. Thank you, sir. I gave it back to him, but it was such a such an inspiration and such a help. But the book is called uh, The History of Kansas Newspapers. Uh, the author is William E. Connolly, published in 1916. Um, he told me, oh, I'm, I'm on the wrong slide. I'm sorry. He told me that... Um, I, he's like, I don't know if you're going to be able to find this anywhere. I don't know if I'd be able to find it anywhere either. Uh, you would probably have a copy in this Kansas Historical Society. I'm sure you guys will be a source. I will say reading this was so inspirational. I read this when I was on the road and it loved it. It fueled me to make these photographs. I was so thrilled. And to read from the voice of somebody that had just witnessed this industry at its birth in Kansas. It was remarkable. <laughs> well, Diana gives you an all caps thank you for your project <laughs> and your presentation. Um, <laughs> uh, this, this is a pretty, pretty good comment. I wonder how many Kansas newspapers made you a news item? 
You're a true <laughs> pioneer poet patriot. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that. That's, that's from Whitney, uh, editor, Dodge oh. City Globe. All right. Hey, Whitney, hello. <laughs> Mm. So I mean, th this this was I, I really appreciated this so much that um, you know when I'd go into a newspaper office and I was interested, I was curious, and you know most of the time I found that the people I spoke to they were eager to have a conversation because I cared about the things they cared about, and I was someone to sort of just have that conversation with, and so sometimes like you know, I could tell conversation was maybe becoming an interview <laughs> or they'd sit down and it'd become an interview. But that was great because what really I was doing, I was interviewing them <laughs> at the same time. And um, I, I so appreciated it. So yeah, a number of newspapers, including the Dodge City Globe, thank you, Whitney, uh, published uh, uh, stories after my visit. Um, and I think just a, a little quick research from... Uh... One of our team members here says that book has been reprinted, and I believe that you can pick it up on Amazon. But uh, there's there's probably some other outlets as well. There um, won't get that first edition, right? Yes, feel, <laughs> that fragile, beautiful document. Well, and the, the smell, the glorious smell. Of <laughs> the words will be the same. <laughs> uh, Karen asks if there's any way to uh, sign up for more information regarding your upcoming project. Um, you, you know, if you, um, if you write to me, I have my email address again, it's on my website. It's easy to find. There's a contact thing. If you write me and just say, Hey, keep me updated. I have a little list that I send things out. Don't worry. I don't send things out very much. Usually about twice a year. <laughs> I just sent somebody, uh, an email out last night that just listed, for example, uh, different publications that had featured the work, interviews I had done. I uh, was a guest on uh, uh, NPR um, a couple of weeks ago. And so it's just links to those kind of things and also announcements of different talks. And certainly when I get my publication together, it'll be out there. And um, hopefully, again, I, 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 I hope that it'll have a national audience and be able to share it in kind of a national way soon too. Perfect. Uh, and this is a, a first. We we normally don't have uh, replies in in the questions, but uh, <laughs> Emily Emily has uh, said Lois as the director of the Kansas Press Association. There is a lot of hope and amazing work being done. Support your local newspaper. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> um, again, another thank you, Jeremiah, for a fabulous talk. Um, Will tonight's talk be available uh, through viewing on our website? Yes, it will. Yeah, on that YouTube channel. Uh, uh, they said they want to make sure several people become aware of Jeremiah's project and work. Well, thank you very much for, for spreading this news. We greatly appreciate it. Um, and again, just rolling in Dallas. Thank you, Jeremiah. It's amazing. Important work. <laughs> um, Karen asks uh, if this will be a book. Um, that's, that's going to be the ultimate goal. Um, I mean, at first I want it to be a newspaper <laughs> and like, uh, and so I'll just speak a little bit more about that. I read, uh, several kind of long quotes in this talk that came because I had asked a number of people that I had met to contribute columns, article, little dispatches, if you will, from across the state of Kansas. So I was very happy to be able to pull from some of those, but those are going to be a part of the newspaper project. And so those will have a home in there. So it would, it would be great uh, uh, to read more about what these people have had to say about the newspapers in their community. Um, but ultimately, yeah, I do, I do hope for it to be a book. And this process usually takes several years to happen. And as a photographer, uh, the, the quality, the, repro the quality of the reproductions, the design, all of those things are of paramount concern. And so I hope, you know, I want to find a publisher that really wants to treat this material right in a way that really honors this. And so... I'm uh, going to be reaching out to publishers uh, soon. And the, the last body of work that I finished is a monograph. It's a hardcover book that's available out there. Um, uh, and so I hope this will be too. 
<laughs> Perfect. Well, again, got to keep us posted. Uh, <laughs> um, we got a, a few few questions left this evening um, from Anne. Uh, such a great talk, Jeremiah. As a local history librarian in KCK, I could not do my job without access to the small local papers and the news they reported on their people and communities. And I use the KSHS digital newspapers database every day. Yes, fantastic resource, and it is free to all Kansas residents through our website, kshs.org. Um, so be sure to go and check that out on our research tab. It is just, it's really cool. You can really Thank blow you, them man. up. Uh, yeah. They're in great, great, uh, high quality resolution. So uh, great resource. Um, from Tina, uh, listening from Kansas City with a huge smile on my face. Thank you, Jeremiah, for your passion, your artistic commitment, and the voice you've given and will continue to give to the people of Kansas and in turn to people everywhere. You are, you are a conduit of voices past and future. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> That's very so kind. Sweet. So kind. Thank you. Thank and you. Then we got one last thank you uh, from Karen. Um, so I, I would say uh, your presentation was a success, Jeremiah. Uh, <laughs> they just keep rolling in. Um, well, again, thank you so much for your time um, this evening, Jeremiah. Uh, this has been a blast. Um, I'm going to definitely keep following you for any updates in, in the future. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and I hope that everybody can join us again next month, Wednesday, April 12th, uh, same time, 6.30 p.m., to hear author Robert Connor discuss a key player in bleeding Kansas in the Civil War uh, in his latest book, James Montgomery, Abolitionist Warrior. So from all of us here at Museum After Hours, thank you so much for tuning